All right, thank you very much for coming. Um, I think there are not. I think I'm the only person speaking to, uh, this weekend who's speaking about audio. Uh, so I think there's probably not many people around here who do work with audio. Can I just see a show of hands if there's any who do? There's a few. Just. All right. Yeah. So, so mostly not. So this is great. I get to I get to sort of uh, uh, preach the message here because there's some really really interesting things you can do with sound. Um, we have a little sound recording playing of a bird. I don't know if you recognise it. Anyone recognise it? Say. Yes. Yeah. Blackbird. So yeah, blackbird with the yellow beak. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice example of bird song. So, if, so I'm going to I'm going to be talking about a few, a couple of different things. But one of the one of the principal things we might want to do with bird sound is recognise which bird is singing. And the blackbird's a really nice example because it's singing this song repeatedly, but it's not making exactly the same sound every time. We can see there's a general pattern to it, and we can, I can talk for ages about what the general pattern might be, um, but it's actually very difficult to specify, and we can't just sort of say, here's a sort of standard template for this particular bird type or this particular individual. So, lots of really interesting questions. I'm just going to stop the sound for now so that I can talk with a bit less distraction. There we go. Um, yes, so I'm an academic. I'm a researcher at Queen Mary. Uh, so the Machine Listening Lab is a group we have um, at Queen Mary, University of London, which is about three tube stops from here. So you can come and visit. Um, uh, it's uh, the Machine Listening Lab. We're using signal processing and also machine learning to try and make sense of sounds and to do things with sound. Um, you might have seen some of the talks this weekend touching on image processing, touching on natural language processing. Um, Audio, you'll, you'll, you'll have seen lots of applications of speech uh, technology, but in general, audio is, is really quite underdeveloped. There's lots of uh, audio archives, for example, which we can't really get a lot of information out of because we don't have a lot of very rich ways of dealing with that data. The same for increasingly, there are sensors everywhere. There are lots of projects where um, there are audio sensors continuously monitoring, and we'd like intelligent decisions to be made from those. So a few things that we do in our lab, um, uh, music transcription, uh, we can take audio signals and, and in various ways try to turn those into a symbolic representation of what's going on in the music. Um, we did a computer-generated musical, which is uh, one of the uh, slightly more unusual things we've attempted. And uh, I'm going to be talking about the bird recognition. So today I'm going to be talking about bird species recognition and other things. Um, and we have all kinds of questions about that. Can we decode the dawn chorus? So this is a spectrogram. Um, how many of you are familiar with spectrograms? Okay, relatively familiar, thank you. So yes, we've got time here, we've got frequency from low to high, and this is about uh, 10 seconds recorded from a dawn chorus. There's lots of birds going on in there, um, all overlapping with each other, all, as I said, doing different things every time, not necessarily repeating exactly the same template. But there are lots of questions we want to ask about it. Which species, as I've said, how many birds are they singing in response to uh, their neighbours, or are they... Uh, are they warning about predators, so there could be interactions between the birds. There's lots of different questions we want to ask. And I'm not actually, so I come from a, a background in uh, computer science and sound processing. I'm not actually an ornithologist, um, but there are lots of reasons to be asking these things. Uh, people from environmental organizations, from monitoring organizations come to me all the time uh, asking about how to solve these kind of questions. Um, because audio monitoring is extremely useful, I'm going to try and show you why. If we have this, uh, this natural scene here, and we want to detect exactly what sort of bird is present. Uh, if you use an image recognition uh, pipeline, you're not going to get very far. Um, so actually, for someone who works in sound, um, birds are a particularly handy uh, thing to be working on, because you can't just say, uh, unlike for... Um, uh, recognizing mammals in the in the undergrowth, uh, audio is actually the best modality for, for detecting and analyzing bird sounds. As I said, there are people who care about this. Um, 
A lot of it is in conservation and, and ecology monitoring. Uh, as uh, climate change, for example, does make uh, different bird populations move slightly into different places, and so the ongoing monitoring year by year, we really want to be able to scale that up. Work out, for example, how changes in ecosystems are changing um, uh, the, the, the balance of birds and other animals in different locations. It's actually not, um, climate change isn't the biggest driver in terms of bird populations, but it's actually changes in farming practices across Europe and elsewhere that have made the biggest differences to what's going on. But those have had a dramatic effect on bird populations and uh, other animals. Um, there are other reasons that we might want to study uh, bird sound and other animal sound. Partly it's, it's looking at the evolution of things like language. So humans have this uh, almost unique quality of learning this complex language uh, uh, during childhood, but actually birds learn, uh, songbirds in particular, learn their song from, uh, from tutors during uh, their early stages. And so people are studying the processes that, that lead to this. So... If we take large data sets of bird sound and we can analyze the patterns in those bird sound and how those progress, for example, from generation to generation, can we understand something about evolution and uh, uh, even language? So, um, because, as I said, this is a, a, an audience that's uh, relatively unfamiliar with uh, sound, I thought it'd be kind of handy just to give you some very generic uh, tips. So, I'm not going to be talking about speech recognition a lot. I'm not going to be talking about speech recognition much at all. It's a very developed field, I'm sure you know. Um, it is very specific to the tasks that are, are required of speech recognition. So, you can't, in general, take a speech recognition algorithm and use it to detect um, boats going past on the Thames. You can't really use it to detect, uh, the, to understand the sequences of sounds that birds are producing. Um, there are other nice things. Shazam, I don't know how much that's well known, but that's an um, algorithm for identifying music tracks. Again, that's actually a very specific algorithm, and, and it's a really interesting algorithm I can tell you about sometime. But these, these, these off-the-shelf things that you might know by name are not actually that useful for general sounds or for animal sounds. Uh, the most common approach uh, in a lot of cases is to pretend a spectrogram is an image. So there's the spectrogram. You could just pretend that it was a photo of something and use pretty much any image processing pipeline you like. Um, in general, that's not a bad approach. So lots of people who are doing uh, machine learning applied to any kind, kind of general purpose sound recognition um, task at the moment, um, the, a lot of the leading methods are based on convolutional neural networks, in particular also recurrent neural networks, applied to the spectrogram as if pretending it was an image. Um, there's a few things that you might miss from that. So, I mean, firstly, I said that th this, is, this is an image. Uh, we've got time along this axis and frequency along this axis. So one thing is, um, those are not equivalent axes. They have very, very different meanings. So do you really want to treat them the same in, in the pipeline that you're uh, analysing? Another thing that's quite common in sound is harmonics. If you have um, a sound whose fundamental frequency is down here, it might also be associated with higher fundamentals. And so um, the object that is in the uh, image there is actually sort of spread out across the image. And so if, for example, you're using convolutional neural networks with a, a sort of a local uh, uh, field of attention, then there, there, are, there are losses in simply using a standard off-the-shelf pipeline there. Uh, tools. So uh, we use all the standard Python machine learning libraries. Um, the, the main thing which might be new to you, I'm going to say, is Libroso, which is uh, a really handy library for loading and saving audio files of various sorts, for producing spectrograms, for also for doing things like, um, well, actually, a, a wide variety of features, not just spectrograms, but a lot of the kind of standard things that people who do audio signal processing uh, use every day. So um, it's really as simple as that in terms of libraries, so uh, I'm happy to recommend that. Uh, I'm going to tell you then um, about sort of the story of how we took bird species classification, did some research on it, and then turned it into um, an app which we now uh, sell in the UK. And it's called Warbler. Uh, the idea is you have uh, your, the app on your phone. You don't know what that blackbird is, so you record 10 seconds of it, and then that sends it to our server. We give you an answer. There's... Um, 
so I'm an academic and I did this work, this sort of commercialization work, partly, um, partly as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way of actually making, something, making the initiative sustainable because in academia we can have a project that lasts for two years and then just goes off a cliff. Um, I wanted to see this as a thing that people could use and that people could sort of, and that would be an ongoing project that would just be, you know, it's just some kind of tool that you would have on your phone. Um, we also work with open data and we have, uh, as part of the way we've designed this system, we have a kind of a give and take where we say that um, people who contribute audio recordings to this, their recordings will be published anonymously as um, open data. And so we're building with this initiative open data sets of bird sound recordings that can be used for uh, various research purposes. So there's a nice kind of give and take there. We, we built it as a commercial pro project, but not, not just a straightforward, um, here's a thing you can buy, a commercial project. So we want to take 10 seconds of bird sound and predict what sort of bird it is. Uh, that kind of thing has been done in the past uh, in some research papers, but actually, if you, if you think about what's practical, uh, these kind of, um, let's say in the 2000s, research papers would do things like they would classify between 10 different bird species, uh, but they'd be really clean recordings and it's, it's not got any background noise on it. Not really uh, useful. If you go out with your mobile phone into um, some uh, nearby forest, there's actually potentially more than 200 species that either live in the UK or pass through the UK that you potentially might hear. Um, and if you go to uh, the tropics, there are even more. So, so really, if, we, if you're designing a bird classifier, it's, it's a pretty large number of classes. And of course, there might be more than one bird active at a time. So just briefly, this is, this is just a, a, a kind of a case study of how we uh, specifically engineered some features to, to, to lead to good learning in the, in the case of bird sounds. Um, so that blackbird example I, was, I played you at the start, we, have, we, don't know, uh, we don't have an exact template that we can work with. And as I said, w with the sort of full, f uh, full range of frequencies, there might be information in different frequency bands. What I'm going to just talk you through very quickly is a kind of feature learning process that we used, uh, which is a little bit like a, a kind of convolutional filter. So Here's a spectrogram, and th for the input data, we're simply going to divide it up into frames, um, but they're going to be full height frames, so the full frequency width, but say about 10 or 20 milliseconds of time. And, oh yeah, this is in slightly the wrong order. Let me do it this way. So then what we want to do is actually learn uh, a basis uh, set, uh, a set of features on which we can sort of project that data. And so we're learning that from, from the types of very brief, as I said, 10 or 20 milliseconds, the type of very brief gestures that birds tend to make in, in, in audio. And here from a large amount of bird song, uh, unlabeled, we've learned some typical things that go on. There's a lot of individual frequencies there. There's also uh, some interesting stuff like here we've got a kind of downward chirp. So we've got a slightly, uh, very you know, stereotypically birdy sound. You've got a downward going chirp that also has some harmonics on top of it as well. So we're learning uh, sort of what tends to be going on in these bird sounds. And then we take the data, uh, and then we project it back onto this basis set. So it's, it's, it's basically just a, a matrix projection, but it's actually taking the data and transforming it into a way that uh, actually um, represents it in a way that the differences between different species are actually emphasized. And those are relatively micro level, okay? Uh, we repeat that uh, twice in our case to, to, to have a sort of a low level and a slightly higher level version. Uh, in order to do that, we got uh, some uh, handy little algorithms. I'm just going to point at these because they're cute algorithms that uh, I think people should know. Maybe you do already. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, of course, we had a lot of data, too much data to store in memory. Um, this this algorithm, this first one here, is just really simple, but um, a nice st streaming algorithm to take a, a uniform random sample of data. You've got a billion data points, you stream them through once, and you want to take a uniform random sample from those billion. Um, there's a very, uh, very simple uh, algorithm from the, I think, 60s or 70s, reservoir random sampling, which just does it in about, uh, let's see, I think it's about uh, 15 lines of code, and so I've just got a GitHub there. Um, 
Uh, and in order to, to estimate these uh, templates, let me call them, we used uh, a kind of k-means clustering. Um, so you can do k-means clustering in an online fashion. You've got a billion points, you stream through and you through once, and you've got your, your k-centroids. Um, the difference here with us is that it's actually something called spherical k-means. So instead of... Um, with, with ordinary k-means, you're estimating sort of the, the centroids of these clusters. Uh, with spherical k-means, we're actually estimating unit vectors. So we're not just estimating where the data are, but unit vectors that point towards the data. And that actually just makes it magnitude invariant. So what that means is that each of these, although they don't look like unit vectors, they're actually, um, you know, if you vectorize them, they're just unit vectors, and that's, that's the basis on which we're re reprojecting them. So that's the fundamental algorithm. I haven't got into a lot of detail of that. You can ask me questions afterwards. But then uh, it worked, basically. We, we submitted it to um, an international uh, classification uh, challenge, and it got surprisingly good results, which is what led us, actually, towards uh, thinking it was actually worth... Uh, uh, putting onto people's phones, and we produced this app. So this is now commercial. Uh, it's been selling for uh, two and a half years now in the UK. It's been doing really well, and uh, we're about to uh, launch a US version. As I said, you record 10 seconds of sound. It gives you a ranked list of what species it thinks uh, it thinks it is. Uh, the architecture we went for something pretty simple, and the um, the. So the architecture is, is pretty much uh, a, a separation between the, uh, the, uh, the phone app and the, sort of the, the cloud surface that's backing it. So the, 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 the phone app is, is not doing any of the machine learning side of things. We simply send the audio to the server. There are a few different reasons for that. One of them is because, as I said, we're lo we want to collect this audio data uh, to, uh, for open data sets, and so we're aggregating all of that data. Um, the other, th and then we send the bird species uh, decision back, of course, uh, over a simple rest request. Um, the real advantage, the absolutely massive advantage that we had, was that to go from research to deployment was really, really straightforward. My code was already in Python, uh, a lot of SK learn and things like that, uh, and we simply wrapped it in a pyramid web, web service, and there you go. Um, that gave us loads of advantages, such as being able to improve the system without having to redeploy the phone app and so on. Um, the biggest criticism we had was that if you're out in the forest and you don't uh, have any uh, Wi-Fi connection or something like that, then you can't use the bird recognition. That's just a, a cost that we face. We were gambling on data streaming services getting better and better, and that, that turned out okay. So, yeah, um, people started using it. We've got... Um, uh, these, these stats are a little bit old, actually, now, but we've got uh, 5,000, 6,000 paying users, uh, lots and lots of recordings, get 80 per day, um, more in the spring than in the winter, you know, things like that. It's, it's basically fine. And um, not being a very commercially-minded person, I haven't done a lot of these kind of... Uh, 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 sort of launches of products before and I learned something about like what people do when they get their hands on technology so as I said you record 10 seconds of sound and it predicts what bird it thinks it is um, at, immediately after launch we got a few interesting bits of feedback like this um, they tested the warbler app <laughs> on the photocopier um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, this, this is a really nice example, but the other side effect, which was really surprising, um, is, so, as I said, you record 10 seconds of sound, and we collected these things. As a result, we now, I think, have possibly the largest database of bird impressions in the world, <laughs> um, and we're trying to think of something interesting to do with that data. So, yeah, we can recognize bird from, a bird from someone whistling the sound? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that, that's sort of the, the first story I wanted to tell you about, about automatic bird species classification. And so we released, so we did the research on that, and then we've released it as an app for people to use. It does also relate to sort of uh, ecological monitoring projects, and so you know, with, with uh, data sets that people record out in the forest, we want to go ahead and sort of use that for uh, for larger projects. Um, 
I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a couple of very brief postcards of sort of active research, and then I'm going to talk about something to do with bird detection, which is um, hopefully, uh, hopefully a, 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 something that you could even get engaged in if you wanted to. Uh, so one of the things we're working on at the moment is actually what, partly related to the problem that we have so little data. So if you work with speech, you're extremely lucky because so many databases of annotated speech, people transcribe the speech, people um, uh, trans transcribe the speech in multiple languages. With animal sound, bird sound, we don't have that. We have to work with uh, either completely unsupervised data, obviously we don't actually know what the birds are saying to each other, um, but also with data that might be weakly labelled. So on the left hand side you see we've got Actually, what, what typically happens when you have a bird watcher out in the field, they'll, they'll, they'll have a list and they'll say, I saw a robin, I saw a blackbird, I didn't see one of these. Um, but actually what we want, especially in like archive applications, so for example, the British Library has this fantastic big sound archive of natural sound, um, but that is weakly labelled. It just says, there is a robin in this recording somewhere. We'd like, in order, to, in order for actual data mining to be useful, we'd like to know where in the sound recordings those are. And so we're working on this um, uh, uh, sort of paradigm um, of, of being able to make inferences from weakly labeled data. So that's, that's a nice uh, prospect that you can train a system even though the training data isn't as precise as you would like. Um, that's something that we've just submitted. I'm just going to uh, leave that there for now. Similarly, I'm just briefly going to talk about sequences. So. Birds sing uh, often in sequences of units, and we'd like to make sense of that. In the long term, we would like to know what birds are saying to each other. Is What's the information content in there? Um, and so for, uh, for, for birds, uh, as I said earlier, we can't straightforwardly just use a speech recognition pipeline. One of the reasons is that um, there's often lots of birds singing at once, and... Of course, lots of people would like to be able to decode multiple speakers at once, and that's, that's still a hard problem. Um, with bird sounds, we do things like we take a sequence of bird sounds, and we want to automatically predict which, which sound belongs to which bird. And so it's related to source separation. It's actually just detecting uh, kind of uh, sort of graphical in terms of graph theory, kind of connection from one sound to another. So we can start to, we can start to look at sequences and how they influence each other. So that's an ongoing thing. I just wanted to give you a little postcard of it because we do classification, we do detection, we do these other things. Um, I'm not today talking about some of the more intricate um, uses of machine learning because I wanted to be, uh, uh, I wanted to give an overview of these different topics. Um, I want to go to possibly the simplest thing, uh, which is bird detection. So, um, apparently it's a simple question. Are there any birds in this audio clip? Now, is that an easier question or a harder question than what species of bird is in this audio clip? Easier? Harder? Yeah, it's... <laughs> I, I like the fact that you're sort of evenly split there, because I'm evenly split. It's... Um, like, if you, if you think of, of, of this as a binary classification problem, birds, no birds. The birds class is this really difficult class which basically has everything in it. It has blackbirds, it has owls, it has all the crazy birds you could ever detect. So, while on the other hand, there are commonalities between these birds, right? So, we, if we, there should be some advantages as well as disadvantages. But the fundamental point is that Answering this question is really, really useful, uh, for, especially for data mining large data sets where birds are sparsely present. We'd like to detect uh, animal sounds so that we can uh, either manually inspect them or to process them later. So there are detectors out there. You can use a kind of sort of template detector to detect a bird, uh, a specific bird. But the, the real gap in the state of the art is actually doing that generally. Um, so last year we designed an, a sort of data challenge. We published some uh, open data and a, a public baseline, uh, and we challenged people to produce a system that could uh, that could perform this. So uh, if you've ever worked with data challenges before, this is a sort of the classic machine learning data challenge setup where we give you some training data with labels, 
we give you some test data without labels and the challenges to actually get the answers right. Um, in order to make this a difficult task for generalization, we, we, took, we had training data. Part of the training data actually came from the phone app, right? So we had this data recorded on mobile phones around the UK, all kinds of different parts of the UK, and that was the training data. For the testing data, we had all kinds of other things. So we had um, an entire remote monitoring data set from Chernobyl, where there, are, there is a hot, an exclusion zone where people aren't allowed to go, and so we have remote monitoring there. And what surprised me was that people still got pretty good results. So um, this is each, each of these dots is a different sort of competitor in the challenge, and the results were getting up to about 90%. Uh, really pretty good. Uh, we're rerunning this again this year, and this is partly why I wanted to talk about this. This is a challenge that you can take part in. So. Um, Last year, oh, so, well, it's actually the year before last now. But we ha so we, we ran this challenge. We had prizes for the uh, we had prizes for the best submission. We also had prizes for the most interesting submission because um, we really didn't want just a whole pile of the same convolutional neural network uh, submitted. So it was great to see diverse approaches. Um, and we're doing this again this year. So um, it's part of a larger initiative. It's called DCase, which is Detection and Classification of Audio Scenes and Events. There are five different tasks. So there are, there are new open data sets, big data sets of audio that you can uh, download. And, and we have a baseline deep learning code. You'll, you'll recognize this is often, uh, I think all of the baselines are in Keras. And um, you can download it from dcase.community. There is a challenge for bird sound. There is a challenge for, uh, I think, indoor uh, home event detection, things like that. Um, Yes, I guess that's it. I, so I kind of haven't really fin finished the story on that, that DK's thing. Sorry. So the, um, we've, got, we've, got more data, uh, we've got more data collected. We've got data from the USA and other, and other data. And so the, the real challenge is generalization. I think one thing that's been really interesting in uh, this weekend uh, for me has been uh, the, uh, the practical uh, application and evaluation of methods. And so... In a lot of talks that I've seen, it's not enough if uh, a system seems to get a particular percentage. Um, it's actually whether it actually works in your, uh, in your business case or on uh, data that is non-stationary. And that's what we're trying to aim at here. So we're really trying to improve the state of the art so that it's not just um, about getting a particular percentage, but about being able to generalize and being able to do a job that... Um, Basically, that when some ecologist downloads your data and goes to use it in Australia, we can expect that it will get a pretty good result. So um, a lot of this is uh, open, open source and open data. We do go for uh, uh, open copyleft licenses as much as we can, and so there's plenty of stuff to play with. Um, and I hope that I've, I've shown you a bit that there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different challenges, and this is just in bird sound, I mean, you can also think about uh, analyzing cattle sounds or uh, outdoor sounds, you know, along the river, along the street. There are some industrial applications starting to come in, so part of that, some of that actually comes from smart cars with uh, audio detection on smart cars. There are a few different things, uh, well, so many different things in audio analysis. And I hope that through, through these open data sets, you'll be inspired to just have a little dabble and see what you can do. Um, I'm going to uh, acknowledge, thank the, the, the different sort of Python uh, tools and libraries we use. Um, so I mentioned Libroza for audio processing. In terms of machine learning, we are sort of using... Uh, oh, I didn't put scikit-learn on the list here. Well, anyway, so we've got, we, we are sort of using these sort of three different kind of paradigms. This, uh, we do plenty in Keras and TensorFlow. Also, there was uh, Theano and Lasagna. Anyone with Lasagna here? Sorry? I know, I know, I know. I just, I just like lasagna, but uh, yeah, I know. Everyone's on Keras and TensorFlow these days, so I just wanted to see a little bit of a yay. Anyway, and, and yeah, thanks to Pyramid as well for letting us turn our uh, research code straight into a web service. That's great. Um, you can download the slides there, and, and uh, that's me, that's the app, and that's the data challenge. Uh, we've got plenty of time left, so I hope you've got questions about bird sound. I think we, could, we should do it that way. So, thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you for your awesome talk. Very interesting. Uh, just a small technical question. On your graph, where you have the spectrogram, so what is your max frequency? Uh, it's the area on the curve. Um, I mean, I mean, like your, you, you've got your, um, you know, ton no, 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 on your spectrograms, the spectrogram, ah. and you got like, um, you know, you got windows of 50 milliseconds, but what is your max frequency? And you know, is that like, what frequency do you go up to when you? So uh, we're we're actually using uh, standard CD quality sounds. So that's 44 kilohertz sampled, um, and then. What you see here, and actually, uh, yes, so what we're doing actually, uh, in, in order to do a little bit of data compression, um, we've taken the standard spectrogram and then we've actually compressed it into the MEL spectrogram, which uh, might be a word you're familiar with. It's a slightly warped frequency axis. Uh, but then it's going from about 100 hertz here, well, yeah, you know, let's say, uh, we high pass filter it for the bird sound, so we're starting from about 500 hertz here, and then it is going up to the 22 at the top. Um, uh, for a lot of speech applications, you can get away with just using the lower frequency bands. For birds, you can't, because there are a lot of, there's um, uh, the gold crest, I think, sings at like 10 kilohertz or 12 kilohertz, so you do have to be careful. So, uh, sorry, for that 10 or 12 kilohertz, you know that the, if the fundamental is 10 or 12 kilohertz, then there are harmonics way beyond 22 kilohertz. Um, but in, in general, CD quality is okay for bird sound. Cool, thank you. Hi. Um, if you were to open source your product and uh, offer it to all the bird aficionados all around the UK and the world, would you be able to basically use it for sustainability projects? I'm not sure I understand the cause and effect in the question there. What, what's the, what's the, what's the, the relationship the idea is to the open to, source? To basically give it as a tool to the community in order to uh, basically spot birds. Yeah. Um, have actually proof that this bird was spotted in a certain location mm. and then basically use hard facts to go to the government and say, okay, these areas um, harbor so and so many um, birds and so on and so on. Yep. Yes, yes, you could do. You could do. Um, we, uh, so so in, in terms of the simple sustainability of the project, that, that, that's, I mean, this is a big question. I, I was really going back and forth on whether to fully open source or not. And we, we went for this commercialization route because I think actually in practice it does make it a more sustainable project. Um, in ecology and conservation, we're working with a lot of people who uh, might actually know a fair bit of R, but, but don't know uh, how to do uh, machine learning or to work with these other things. So there's certainly a question of who and how is going to sustain a service like that. Um, uh, in terms of the evidence for things, at the moment, um, a lot of the evidence comes directly from sort of manual surveying. And that's not very scalable, um, but it, it, it does have certain reliability guarantees that we don't have from automatic detection. So there's still some questions around that. Machine learning often gives fuzzy results. So there's, there's, there are error bars, and the how to incorporate all those error bars together into, into creating um, things that should guide government policy, that's still something which we have a lot of discussions with um, stati statistical ecologists about. Uh, thanks for the talk. I really like the warbler idea. Um, just wondering, do you, uh, or have you thought about using the GPS uh, location for building, you know, improving the predictions? Yeah, I've got a story about that, yes. We do. So, um, so thanks to the British Trust for Ornithology, who have been doing some of this manual surveying for decades, they have a, a map of where we expect to see particular birds. Um, they allowed us to use that data, so we have this kind of, we have the GPS location and we have a bit, and that gives us a bit of a prior. Um, now, the issue with that is that if you give people an app to recognize bird sounds, the first thing they'll do uh, is play a sound from their laptop. Um, and the GPS location isn't, expect, isn't, isn't leading to an expectation of a kookaburra in, uh, in uh, West London. The, the other thing that, uh, that happens that's unexpected is that people go to Camden, well, to London Zoo in Camden, and the data doesn't actually tell you about London Zoo either. So um, 
there are pros and cons to using that, but we do we collect the GPS data and we do we do use it, um, and it does, apart from those caveats, it does help to pin down the the, the decision. Great, great talk, thanks. Um, uh, maybe you said it, I missed it, but how do you acquire your training data set? And did you ever think of using Warbler in order to get input from the user? in order to mm. label mm. your data set? Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, part of the... Oh, I'm going the wrong way in the slides here. Part of the design, we really wanted the user journey to be really, really simple because this is... This is, this is uh, expert birders don't need the app. Expert birders can already hear what they're hearing, but um, this is for ideally for the general public um, to go, what's that sound? It's that. So we tried to keep the... Um, the user journey as simple as possible. We, there is an option to give feedback on whether the, re, the results are right or not. But given what I've just said, you'll understand people don't usually know if the, if the answer is right or not. So we have uh, less than 1% of the data people give feedback on. Oh, and you, you also asked where the training data came from. Um, there's a, a project based in the Netherlands called Sino Canto, which is basically just a big crowdsourced database of bird recordings. So we started with that. Um, there's some interesting questions around there. That's, that's actually a Creative Commons licensed content. And we, we, there's a lot of uh, head scratching about whether we were allowed to use it to train a commercial system. Um, we came to the conclusion that we were, and we're friends with the project anyway, so, uh, so that came through okay. Thanks for the talk. Uh, you said that the expert birders know what they're uh, hearing. So um, can you beat that uh, expert level uh, performance in recognizing bird sounds? Uh, with the current state of the art, no. No, we can't, we can't beat a real expert bird. Um, the, uh, let's see if I can, well, I don't think the spectrograms here are really gonna show the point that I want to make, but um, one thing is that the, the data is, Audio data is very, very subtle in the sense that um, if there's a bird near you, then it's going to be quite prominently present in the data, and that, that we can, we, we can uh, equal uh, expert birders. But the place where uh, any algorithmic paradigm you care to mention doesn't do very well, um, people with not only their stereo hearing, but also their contextual knowledge are very good at hearing a sound a kilometre away in a forest. Um, and it's extremely difficult to come up with uh, an approach that's going to actually do that uh, in, in machine learning terms. You know? Because um, in signal terms, this very, very distant sound is so embedded in the noise, it's really hard to distinguish uh, accurately. Just out of curiosity, do you know how much information you actually add by the spectrogram? Or have you tried different spectrograms? Uh, so how much information we? Um, so technically, you could just put in the time series, which would contain the same information ah. as the spectrogram. Mm. Do you just Have you ever played around with that? Uh, yes. So the, well, uh, one, uh, a, f a first thing to say is that the, uh, we tried, uh, we tested the classifier directly on the spectrogram. We tested it on, di uh, on the sort of, uh, the, 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 the learnt features that I told you about. We also tested it on a sort of, uh, a reduced version of the spectrogram, which used to be common, it's called MFCCs. But anyway, sort of, a sort of data reduced version of the spectrogram. Um, and uh, the, the, feature, the feature learning does improve results, the spectrogram, again, provides more information than the MFCCs. So there is an improvement there. On the raw audio data, uh, not directly on our data sets, but, but there are various tests uh, in, in sort of machine learning applied to audio which do go directly from the raw waveform. It can be useful, um, especially if you have extremely large data sets, which typically just means speech data sets, um, but if you look at what's happening in the first layer of learning, they're typically learning something a lot like a frequency representation that is, that is very similar to a MEL spectrogram. So it could help, but only if you have a whole pile of spare GPUs that you need to burn. I think we're, 
We're out of time for questions, but I would like to thank our speaker. And thank you. Thank you.